black lights and boots burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Welcome to Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined today by Professor Lavelle Porter, Assistant Professor of English at the New York City College of Technology. He's the author of the new book, The Black Academic Life, Academic Fiction, Higher Education, and the Black Intellectual, published by Northwestern University Press. How are you doing today, Professor Porter? I'm well, thank you. I would be remiss not to ask, um, how are you handling everything with COVID in New York um, and, and at City University? <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here. That's all I can pretty much say at this point. Uh, you know, it's, it's been a challenge. Um, I'm in Queens, too, so really in the epicenter of all this. Uh, you know, we've uh, had some cases at the, in the CUNY system. So we're just uh, trying to hang in there and do the best we can. That's good to hear. Um, I want to start just with the title of the book, The Black Academic Life. Um, and, and I was struck early in the book where you actually go through the process of, of explaining where the term comes from and citing Mac Johnson and his use of it. Um, and it's funny because I think for most academics, it, it's something that even if we didn't know what it meant, the playfulness of the language, you know, would mean that we knew what it was, right? But there's still folks who are kind of oblivious <laughs> you know, to what it means to be a black academic. Um, but to do a book that revolves around what you call black academic fiction, right, or, or black academic fiction, um, it seems like an incredible novelty. Um, talk a little bit how you came to this project. Well, I came to it uh, through a literary satire. It was, I did a, um, one of my exam fields on uh, black literary satire, and uh, that field included um, Erasure by Percival Everett and uh, Japanese by Spring by Ishmael Reed. And uh, I also did an exam field on the work of Samuel R. Delaney uh, and included the novel The Madman. And so it was really an interview with Delaney where he mentioned The Madman was an academic novel and that kind of sparked my interest. And I noticed these other books that I had on our other list were also academic novels. And so I started to examine <laughs> this, this genre and see, you know, how many more black writers have done these because you know, once you get into this genre, you know about, you know, Lucky Jim and you know about, um, you know, David Lodge's writings, uh, but you don't know about Du Bois and uh, Percival Everett and, and Samuel Delaney and, and all these other folks who've done uh, academic novels. I mean, you cover a century's worth, more than a century's worth of, of Black authors, you know, who are dealing with this genre, if you want to call it, of, of, of fiction. And, and one of the names that I wasn't familiar with, but you spend a quite a bit of time on it, is Sutton Griggs. Oh, yeah. um, talk a little bit about Sutton Griggs, who he was, his career, and, and what he's doing with his own version of the Black academic novel. Well, uh, Sutton Griggs is just a fascinating person in African-American literary history. Um, you know, he, uh, the novel that I cover is called Imperium and Imperial. It's published in 1899. Uh, and the novel's gotten some attention because of this sort of uh, alternative black government that he imagines uh, <laughs> taking place underground uh, beneath this black college in Texas. Um, and, but it has a college setting, and that's really what I focus on. Um, there's been a few people who've written about it, but no one's really written about it as a college novel. And so that was my approach to it. Um, you know, Griggs was a Baptist minister. Um, he was a writer. He was really one of the first black writers to uh, focus his writing to black audiences. You know, um, you think about the earlier periods of black literature, as, as brilliant as that, that literature is, uh, much of it was uh, targeted toward white audiences to, to sort of uh, cultivate a kind of uh, sympathy for the Negro cause. Uh, in his case, he was selling this to uh, black people, uh, particularly going to different churches, you know, that whole tradition of just, you know, selling it out the trunk to whoever will buy it. Uh, that's what he was doing. Uh, so you know, Griggs is really uh, fascinating as a figure in African-American literary history. What did it mean for him to, to do a novel that revolved around black college life um, at a time when attending college for, for black Americans was, was purely aspirational, really, for most folks, right? And, and so was it that he was pitching kind of an aspirational view of black life, you know, through these novels? Um, or, or did he really intend for, for audiences, black audiences, to take seriously some of the claims that he makes in, the book, in, his, in this particular book? Um, I think, you know, in terms of the political uh, angles on it, I think he definitely wanted people to seriously consider uh, his, you know, critique of the legal system and um, African Americans' place outside of it. Uh, there's an interesting scene there where there's a, a the young boy who's 
goes to the assembly at the college and for the first time he sees a, a black professor sitting up um, on the stage. Uh, and that becomes this moment and like, wow, that you can do that. <laughs> like that's a, that's a thing that someone can do. Um, and it's just, and it's just amazing that, you know, as I was writing this book and I saw that scene, I was like, this is exactly, you know, what I'm talking about. He, he makes, uh, creates a representation of what a black academic life uh, might yeah. look like for this character uh, in the novel. Yeah, it, it reminds me of that great line in a, in a Conrad Kent Rivers piece, you know, some black kid is bound to read you <laughs> at some point. And, and it's funny because you mentioned that particular scene, and I think you could almost talk to every working black academic now, and they too will have a moment where they remember <laughs> seeing yeah. a black professor for the first time and go, oh, I can do that, or seeing someone on television going, I can do that. Yeah. What was that moment like for you? Oh, well, you know, you mentioned television. You know, I grew up in the Cosby Show era. So, uh, and I kind of talk about that, it, the complexity of all of that uh, right now. But uh, certainly, yeah, you know, that those representations were important. You know, we can uh, challenge them in, in, in various ways now, but uh, seeing, you know, uh, those black college t-shirts or sweatshirts on that show um, and then seeing a different world. And uh, there's this, you know, brilliant TV series that's all about black college life. You know, that really um, you know, sparked my interest, um, as well as uh, school days. You know, yeah. um, eventually I ended up going to Morehouse. And, uh, you know, the summer before I went there, I was watching school days. W. Du Bois, of course, looms large in your study. Um, talk about Du Bois' work with this particular genre of fiction. Uh, well, it really goes back to some of uh, Du Bois' earliest uh, experiments with fiction. Uh, the novel that I focus most on is The Quest of the Silver Fleece. Uh, and it's kind of about a black academic's life was, that's thwarted. Um, he, the character, uh, really has these aspirations to, to get an education. Um, but uh, the economic situation in which he's in, uh, that was not something that was a possibility for black people. Um, there it is, the, the one character who actually does manage to cobble together something of an autodidactic education uh, in there. So uh, Du Bois, in his earliest fiction, you know, I also include a, a sketch of a novel that he was uh, working on in 1892. Uh, or it's just a sketch of it. I don't know how far it got beyond that. Um, but it was a kind of college novel uh, that he was composing about a, about a white professor. Uh, so he clearly was interested in this genre early on in his career. Uh, and if you look through his uh, works of fiction, uh, almost all of them uh, contain uh, educated black characters or deal directly with black college life. Um, you know, even going down to the, the Black Flame trilogy, which is the last uh, fiction that he composed. You give a shout out early in the book to, to Tressie McMillan Cottom um, mm -hmm. and, and her term, um, what it means to be a working academic. Um, and I, I wanted to unpack that a little bit with you, um, you know, because this is this great scene at the end of the book. Um, where you talk about teaching this class back in the spring uh, or fall of 2017 and, and the black male student who's like, why not actually write mm -hmm. <laughs> about what's actually happening to academics in this mm -hmm. way? And there's a way, particularly when we go back to Griggs's work that, you know, you're, you know, the academic novel, black academic novel actually functions in and of itself as an undercommon um, in the context of what black life is, you know, in the academy. So talk a little bit about that for yourself, those tensions. Yeah, uh, you know, I, there was a, I was really grateful to Deborah Biswas who wrote a um, review of my uh, book for Public Books and she did a comparative analysis of my book and Harney and uh, Moten's uh, undercommons. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and then she kind of draws out the similarities uh, in that we, 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 you know, occupy these positions within these universities that, you know, in some cases really don't want us there or didn't want us there. Uh, and there are various ways in which they make that clear <laughs> to you that you're in an interloper somewhere you don't belong. Um, you know, in some ways you feel welcome. In other ways, you know, you're always reminded, yeah, they really didn't intend us for us to be here. Um, and so you, you try to find a way to, uh, you know, smuggle what you can out of the university. Uh, and, and distribute it out to the people uh, in whatever way that looks like to you. For many, for many of us, it's, it's doing public uh, intellectual work. Uh, so we're not just speaking to other academics, but really trying to uh, speak to broader audiences. Um, you know, it's been very gratifying that how many people who I grew up with, who knew my parents, who knew me, who, who got their hands on this book. You know, I, I think to me, that's, that's really what makes it most fulfilling. Uh, if it were just something that other academics were interested in, 
you know, as useful as that is, uh, that may not necessarily be what I want to do with my career. Yeah, let, let's talk a moment about what it means to be a public intellectual, particularly from your vantage. And, and one of the things I appreciate about your work and in, in your career thus far um, is where you are teaching, right? Mm -hmm. as, as someone myself who started my career at an HBCU and, and then went up to SUNY Albany, you know, where I was teaching three, two, three, three loads, um, the loads that don't allow you to just simply focus in mm -hmm. on the work. Um, there's much to be said about the fact that you are actually functioning as a public inter intellectual, given the types of students that are coming through institutions like that. Yeah, uh, well, I, 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 maybe I am functioning. I don't know. I don't know if I can answer that myself. But uh, well, your students yeah, are yeah. definitely fortunate. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I do the best I can. Uh, we have, we uh, do have to teach a lot of students. I mean, right now. 75 students in my classes, you know, that's a lot of papers to grade. Right, right. Um, it's a lot of work to go through, uh, particularly if you're trying to give them that individualized attention. Uh, that's very difficult to do given the teaching loads that we have. Um, and, um, you know, in some cases it, it, it means burning the candle at both ends in ways that maybe aren't so right. healthy. Right. Uh, that's something I have to, to take into consideration, trying to practice that self care. Um, but it's uh, to me, I, I'm, I wanted to make sure that, you know, at the beginning of this book, I acknowledged the fact that I'm in a teaching intensive institution mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. you know, this is not just another sort of monograph where I had uh, tons of research uh, time and funding uh, to complete the book. Uh, and, 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 and teach in first year writing courses, right? So you're grading yeah. all of that at the same time. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I don't have any TAs to grade that stuff from. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But at um, the same time, you know, it's, it's, it's valuable to engage with these students because you really um, get a sense of what, you know, working class New York is thinking. Mm, um, mm. You know, these students, I, I, I have to think about what's work that I can teach that's going to reach them where they are, you know. Yeah, you, you, when you talk about uh, academic fiction, black academic fiction in the 1980s, um, you mentioned how important the satire of Ishmael Reed was, mm -hmm. um, Japanese by spring. And, and there's a way in which, you know, Ishmael Reed is famous enough to, to be heavily scrutinized by folks, but not well known enough that people actually read his work. Yeah. <laughs> so I appreciate the fact that you, you know, looked at a novel, you know, that's relatively unknown given, you know, the kind of other works that he's done before. Mm -hmm. But you also mentioned that this generation of, of, of Black and Black fiction is also occurring in the same context as The Cosby Show. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and we could also throw into the mix, you know, this kind of first real mainstream public acknowledgement of what a public into Black public intellectual look like, mm -hmm. you know, with, with Cornell and Bell and, and Dyson and all those folks kind of emerging in that moment also. Um, what was it about seeing these images, you talked a little bit about this before, of actually seeing a Black professoriate presented and represented on television as a, a show like different, uh, A Different World did in, in the late 80s and early 90s? Yeah, mostly the book is a literary study, and I really you know, focus on uh, novels. Uh, but I, I did want to mention uh, the significance of television and film because that has a much broader reach. Uh, much as I love these literary works, um, they're not read as widely as mm -hmm. some of these films and television shows. Television seen. shows, right. Yeah. And so um, I really wanted to talk about some of those because those, you know, influenced uh, my own uh, perceptions. And, I, and I'm sure they had a they have a, a broad cultural influence as well. Yeah. You know, now that you're a professor a black professor and you're surrounded by other black professors in conversation with other black professors and you know an authentic authenticity is such a fraught term mm. um, but when you think about some of the novels that you cover and, and even these later depictions in television and film do you think these this genre really captures some aspect of the authenticity of what it means to be a black academic particularly in this moment yeah, that, that's a that's a tough word because that's one that I you know directly address uh, when I talk about erasure, for instance, uh, personal right, erasure. Right, so that, right. Um, you know, I think those those works uh, to some degree they they don't. I say you know I mean because they don't really they can't really depict the day to day uh, activities of what it means to be a professor. It's not all these you know sort of uh, melodramatic moments that you see in, in right, television right. film. It's a lot of you know. Uh, sort of work that doesn't necessarily uh, a, a lot of sitting exciting. around and grading papers, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the authenticity question is tricky because there's a way in which you know black 
academics and intellectuals are you know deemed to be inauthentic black people um, mm -hmm. and that's a that's a question that a lot of uh, black intellectuals are, are addressing in their work um, the ways in which that this, this sort of racial discourse of America uh, forces us uh, forces you know pits black people against each other right yeah. pits class of black people against each other right so if you've reached a certain level of achievement uh, you're no longer like a real black person yeah. Um, and that's, you know, it's a, it's a tricky thing to try to, to navigate because you want to push back against that. Um, but you also, um, you know, don't, you also want to acknowledge that there are like class differences and those are, those are very real things. Yeah. Um, and so this is, I see a lot of uh, black artists working through this, uh, in these novels. You know, as, as a working black academic, um, as a black scholar in this moment, how are you processing, um, everything that's going on, COVID, um, the anti-blackness of the world, you know, seemingly at this moment. I mean, how are you processing this personally? And, and how are you feeling about what your role and responsibility is as an academic, you know, to the tensions that are occurring in this moment? Yeah, in the introduction, I, you know, that's why I addressed the, the Black Lives Matter movement and how uh, it's affected, you know, student activism on campus. Um, you know, there's this moment where a lot of black people who are in academic positions are speaking out and then they end up getting, you know, attacked uh, for speaking out on these issues. Uh, and that's why I kind of started with uh, those cases of uh, public intellectuals who are being attacked, like, you know, Kiyanga Yamada Taylor, I mentioned um, there. And so I think, you know, it's hard to know what exactly to do. I, I, I feel like I don't know what to do myself. Um, try to do the best you can uh, with the resources that you have. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what action to take, but I feel like some, you know, whatever that looks like for you, whether that's uh, really focusing on the writing, uh, that's one of my areas, um, you know, speaking up whenever I can. Um, you know, it, it looks different for different people. I'm not sure exactly what the, the answer is uh, right now, but it's, a, it's, a, it's just a, it's a frustrating time. And I try to, you know, when I teach my students, I try to show some compassion because I know they're going through all right. these things too right. and they're experiencing right. these. Uh, they watch television and they see what's going on in the world. And it's, um, and it's sometimes difficult to, to go through our schoolwork uh, thinking about all the things that are swirling around us. Yeah. What's next for you, Professor Porter? Uh, what's next? Well, um, uh, you know, <laughs> well, you know, it's different uh, projects that I, you know, had to sort of neglect or put aside while I was working on this one. Uh, that's what I'm trying to get to. Understood. Uh, yeah. Understood. Yeah. Samuel Delaney writes of Lavelle Porter and the Black Academic Life. Porter has produced an exciting study of responsibility and representation in a field where for far too long, the educated Negro was the definition of the overeducated Negro. This was a wonderful read for those from whom it is new. It's exciting to have it all so richly and clearly spelled out. Uh, we've been joined today by Professor Lavelle Porter author of the new book, The Black Academic Life, Academic Fiction, Higher Education in the Black Intellectual, published by Northwestern University. Thank you, Professor Porter, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a dream to get on this show, so <laughs> I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Right. Black lights and boots burn when I record for Watts and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all, we take it.